Well, grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to welcome you here to Brentwood Oaks. And we are gathered here today to remember a life well lived, the life of our dear brother Ross Davis. I know it means so much to the family for you to be here this afternoon. It serves as a great source of encouragement to them. Today is a day of mixed emotions. We think about uh, Ross Davis and how God touched so many lives through him. I know almost every person in this room could share memories upon memories about this wonderful man, his charm, his wit, his gentle spirit, his deep abiding love. Ross was a master storyteller. I've heard many stories from him through the years, and we're going to hear some stories this afternoon. Uh, later on in the service, Rayford Walker will share memories that go back decades of serving with Ross here at Brentwood Oaks. But we're going to begin our time here in a moment with Glenn Davis, uh, Ross's son, uh, who's going to read a beloved psalm, Psalm 23. Uh, later on in the service, John Scott Davis will lead some congregational singing. And then at the end of the service, Donovan Davis will read Psalm 127. But before Glenn comes up here, uh, I'd like to lead us in a prayer. Just some instructions uh, at the end of the service. There will not be an official police escort procession headed out to Austin Memorial Park. Uh, so, just following our time here, if you want to attend the graveside, please make your way to the car and head on to Austin Memorial Park there on Hancock for the graveside. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come to you today in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ with thanksgiving in our hearts for your servant, Ross Davis. We're grateful for what you taught us through him. We're thankful for his example of faithfulness through the years that's encouraged the faith of so many. We're thankful for the Davis family, their continued service in the kingdom. We're grateful for Leota and how you brought her into our lives through her marriage with Ross, and we pray blessings upon her family as well. We pray blessings of peace and comfort upon them all. We thank you for sustaining them over the last few months especially. We know that you were present with them as they ministered to Ross. We pray that you would bless this hour, that you would fill our minds and hearts with sweet memories. And may Ross's example spur us on toward greater love and good deeds. We pray that your name will be glorified this day. And it's in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that we lift up this prayer. And together, the church says, Amen. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here today. Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lay down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, I'm gonna ask that we all stand as we sing this, this afternoon. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem. 
him and crown him Lord of all bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all ye chosen seed of Israel's race ye ransomed from the fall hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all hail him you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Oh, that with yonder sacred we at his feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown him Lord of all. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know. I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, well then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know... Though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, well, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I can't feel at home in this world anymore just up in glory land we'll live eternally the saints on every are shouting victory their song of sweet drifts back from heaven's shore and I can't in this world anymore sing it church oh lord you know i have no friend like you if heaven's not my then lord what will i do the angels beckon me heaven's open door and i can't feel at home in this world anymore oh lord you know i have no friend like you if heaven's not my home well then lord what will i do the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and i can't in this world anymore Faithful love flowing down from the thorn-covered crown Makes me whole, saves my Washes whiter than snow Faithful love calms each fear Reaches down, dries each tear Holds my hand when I can Stand on my own Faithful love From above It came to earth to and I'll never be the same for I've seen faithful love face to face and Jesus is his name 
Faithful love is a friend Just when hope seems to end Welcome face, sweet embrace Tender touch filled with grace Faithful love, endless power Living flame, spirit's fire Burning bright in the night Guiding my way, faithful love from above. He came to earth to show the Father's love, and I'll never be the same. For I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is his name. Faithful love from above. He came to earth to show the Father's love. And I'll never be the same For I've seen faithful love face to face And Jesus is His name For I've seen faithful love face to face and Jesus is his name. Be seated, please. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Charlie mentioned that I was going to share stories from decades. At the visitation last night, someone asked me how long I'd known Ross. And at my age, I can't remember. <laughs> no, in actuality... Ross and Joanne moved to Austin in 1953. I came to Austin in September of 1953. Ross was one of the first people that greeted me when I placed membership at University Avenue Church of Christ where they were worshiping. So we have been friends, brothers, classmates, contemporaries, teachers for over 70 years. And it's been a great 70 years. H. Ross Davis, born Harold Roscoe Davis. I just violated what <laughs> Ross wanted me to do. We agreed back in about 1976 that whichever one of us went first, the other would do his eulogy. He cheated. <laughs> he went first. He told me, he said, do not use Harold Roscoe. <laughs> So I said, okay, H. Ross Davis, what does the H stand for? What do you want it to be? As quick as that, he said, how about handsome? <laughs> so handsome Ross Davis was my friend, my brother. Ross was 93 years old eight months and 12 days old when he died. He was a true Christian gentleman. 
a member of the Brentwood Oaks Church of Christ for 67 years. He and Joanne actually placed membership here, not here at the old building, on July the 1st, 1956. He was a teacher, a deacon, a servant. He served as an elder from October the 16th of 1969 until he retired from the eldership after 35 years. Ross was a well-known businessman, co-founder of Dancy and Davis Architects in 1960. He was a beloved artist and storyteller. He lost his father at an early age in the changing needs of the workers during World War II and because of the Depression era in which he came up, his mother and stepfather moved often for work. So Rolf went to six different high schools in Texas, Kansas, Oregon, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. Actually, seven places. That moving, the reacclimation, taught him to be a people person. Ross never met a stranger. He had a great repertoire of funny and old school wisdom, stories, jokes that he loved to share. He developed an alternate persona. I'll let you talk to the kids about that. I'm not going to, to embarrass them by even imitating, but ask them about all Ross's alternate persona. They'll be glad to share that with you, with red faces. <laughs> After high school, Ross attended Abilene Christian College with his best friend, Glenn Tuttle from Ulysses, Kansas. Not only was he voted freshman favorite, but he was baptized into Christ on November the 1st, 1948. It was at Abilene Christian where he met the love of his life, Joanne Merriman of Happy, Texas. They married on October the 4th of 1952. He subsequently graduated from West Texas State University with a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics there he was voted most handsome, ergo the H. <laughs> and then he and his new bride moved to Austin in 1953, where he started at the University of Texas. After serving in the Army, where he was stationed in Germany for a while, he returned to Austin to the University of Texas and graduated with a Bachelor of Architecture and then practiced architecture for 45 years. He was a Legion of Honor member of the Northeast Austin Kiwanis Club, where he served in every capacity for over 60 years. And one of his points of pride was that he had a certificate showing that he had perfect attendance for well over 30 years. I think his last one was 35 years, if I'm not mistaken. But when Ross would travel, he'd make sure to visit local Kiwanis clubs so that he could get a certification to take back to the Northeast Kiwanis Club to show that he was attending and participating. The Lord blessed Ross with many gifts, generosity, a great sense of humor, a good business sense, a love of people, humility. He was a great gardener, a cartoonist, a listener, a hunter, 
a storyteller, and he had the ability and talent to design and paint. And after retiring, he took up his landscape painting and really became fabulous. He did paintings every year that he gave to his children, to Leota. And they were extremely good. If you had, a, I don't remember if there are any in, in the foyer now. There's some good indications of what he, his work looks like. He had the ability to, to meet a family member or a friend where they were, to speak to them about their needs. And he carried with him a sense of wisdom that helped him help them wherever they were. Ross also loved time spending, loved spending time with his family at the ranch in San Saba. In regard to his wonderful talent in architecture, many people in Central Texas may be either living in homes or worshiping in a house of, or church that Ross designed during his professional career, like he did this building, like he did the apartment complex at Village Christian Apartments. It's a mission of this congregation. He designed throughout his professional career and made no effort to keep people advised of just how much he contributed, both in his talent and his ability. Most of all, Ross loved his family, his earthly family, his church family. In his final years, his favorite thing each week was to be here at church with this community. He literally could not wait until Sunday morning. When they'd go by to pick him up, he would be sitting, dressed for church, ready to come. He usually sat right back over in this area. He had a walker. <laughs> the family knows the story here. Since it was a walker, he named it Rayford. <laughs> Later on, he got another walker a smaller, lighter one. And since it wasn't the hefty walker that I am, he named it Ava Lee after my <laughs> wife. I'm not sure that Ava Lee ever forgave him for that. <laughs> Ross was born on June 30, 1930 in Los Angeles, California to Frank and Laurel Davis and Margaret Maris Davis. He was the youngest of two children born to them he was preceded in death by his first wife, Joanne, of 55 years, the mother of his children. He was preceded by his older sister, Shirley Henderson of Fort Bragg, California. His younger half-brother, Jim Shockley of Gold Beach, Oregon. He survived by the new love of his life. Leota Clendenin Davis. Of four children, Deanne Davis, Donovan Davis, and his wife Jeanette, Glenn Davis and his wife Cynthia, all here of Austin, and John Scott Davis and his wife Paula of Granbury. He's also survived by nine grandchildren. Jennifer, Benjamin, Harrison, and his wife, Chelsea, Haley and her husband, Chris, Bryant and his wife, Audrey, Tyler, Delaney, Presley, and Andrew, and great-grandchildren, Evelyn Davis neighbors, and baby Davis, who's on the way. After the passing of Joanne, Ross was very blessed to again find love in his life. And he married Leota on December the 27th, 
of 2008. He was also blessed to add three additional children to his family. Leonda Clendenin of New Mexico, Lon and his wife Lori Clendenin of T Tulsa, Oklahoma, and Lita and her husband John Langford of Edmond, Oklahoma, as well as six more grandchildren, Landon Lawson, Landon, Lawson, Lindy, Blake, Callie, and Evan, Blake, Callie, and Evelyn, or triplets, to whom he was known as Papa Ross. Leota sent me a video that Callie, one of the triplets, made on her own. It showed Ross having contact with those children. If you got an opportunity to see the video, one thing you noticed about Ross Davis was that he had a smile on his face. You never saw Ross with a frown. The kids sometimes saw him with a stern look. <laughs> but he had a smile. And it didn't come from the lips. It came to the lips from the very depths of his heart. He was a loving, caring person. They said in the obituary, the comment, Pop, your quiver is full. That's a quotation from Psalm 127 that Donovan will read to us in just a few minutes. Ross is also survived by his business partner of 50 years, Leo Dancy. They were partners in business, were good friends. They worked through blessed times and tough times, but they always believed in God first, then family, then business, and the Lord blessed them with a great lifelong friendship. I skipped one thing in the obituary when it said that Ross was given the award of being grandparent of the year, I think in 2002. Britwood Christian School was close to Ross's heart. When it started in July of 1963, Ross Davis was one of the three board members who were in charge of seeing that mission develop from a preschool and first grade to all the way to 12th grade. He and George Wilhite and Ray Stewart were the first board members on, for the school. He was extremely proud of Brentwood Christian School. He was proud of the fact that they had achievements in arts and athletics in every area. In fact, last year they won the Henderson Award as the outstanding private school in the state of Texas. I mentioned that Ross spent most, some of his military time in Germany. While he was there, he learned a smattering of German, just enough to be very dangerous. <laughs> he loved to look out for Tammy Driscoll, who's a member of our congregation here. She and her husband were in Germany as missionaries for a while, and Ross would approach her cite John 3.16 in German and then attempt, underline the word attempt, <laughs> to carry on a conversation in German that might include words like, your treehouse is beautiful. <laughs> it, it was something that you had to really listen to. I spent several years in Europe and learn German fluently. 
and Ross and I could carry on a conversation if I guided him. <laughs> In the obituary, Ross is noted as a, a hunter. He, and he was a very good hunter. He and I shared a deer lease for many years, just north of Fredericksburg. One of our greatest joys was to disappear over a weekend, go out on Friday afternoon, spend Friday night and Saturday, be back here for church Sunday morning, disappear after lunch and go back out until dark on Sunday. Ross was a great rifle shot. I mean, he, he was excellent. He was one of the poorest pistol shots I've ever seen. <laughs> one year, I bought a Colt Frontiersman, 44 caliber, pearl handled, silver plated revolver. I took it out. We had three other guys that hunted with us out there from time to time. And so on, during the afternoon one day when we were not out hunting, we decided we'd break in our pistols. My pistol had an eight inch barrel. And Ross looked at it, he said, I've never fired one of those like that. I said, have at it. He shot, I went to look at the bullseye perfect shot. I mean, it was in the center. You couldn't have asked for a better shot. The other guy said, wow, let's see another one, Ross. He said, no, Rayford, here's your gun. I don't want to embarrass anybody. <laughs> Later on, they were ribbing him about it being an accident. So we set up a little uh, practical joke for them. He said, come on out here. This, Ross and I developed this together. He said, come on out here and I'll show you what I can do. I had taken the target and had put a bullseye right in the center. So I took it down to this dead tree that we were shooting at, hanging it on to shoot at. I hung it. Everybody got behind Ross to watch him. He shot this way, he shot this way, he shot this way, <laughs> deliberately missing the target. I pulled the target back, and just made sure I had enough of a little tear to say, Ross, every one of your shots went directly through the same hole. You've never seen three guys with gaping mouths. <laughs> it was another time I had, a, I had a hunting lease, bird lease, south of Blaco. And occasionally Ross and I would go down there and we'd either take business friends or people we were, were just wanting to have a good outing with. We had it stocked with quail and chucker and pheasant. And this one particular day, we decided we'd go to, the, to hunt pheasant. Now pheasant is a beautiful bird. If you haven't seen it, it's got a copper flecked body, a white ring around its neck, red, black head, and a very prominent beak. We were, there were four of us, and so we got our hunting vest on for our ammunition. We had a game bag strapped over our shoulder, and we each had shotguns. Ross was on one end, I was on the other. These two visitors were in the middle. We got out and we jumped up a pheasant. Ross took a shot, and it flew over toward the, the center. Both of those guys took shots and missed. Bam, bam, bam. It got over in front of me. 
and turned toward us just as I shot. Honest truth, I shot one time, that big bird landed in my arms. I was putting it in my game bag and I heard one of the visitors say, Ross, where are you going? I looked over, he had taken his game bag and set it down. He had taken his vest off and set it down and he had laid his shotgun on top of his vest. And they said, Ross, what's the matter? He said, well, if he's trained all those birds to come right to him, I'm just leaving. <laughs> he knew how to make any situation a good story. In his later years, one of the great joys that I had, Roland Beasley, another one of our elders at the time, and I would go by and pick Ross up and take him to lunch at first watch. There, we would greet every one of the servers. Ross knew them by first name. We always had Belgian waffles, bacon, and coffee. And Roland frequently has told me, he said, I'd sit there for the two hours we were there. Y'all would tell these stories. He said, I would just sit there with my mouth open listening that I couldn't believe how well he remembered everything that happened. He did have a good, good memory for that kind of stuff. Ross and I taught Bible class together for more years than I can remember. We started teaching the sixth through the 12th grade. And then as we got more members, the class sizes grew. And so we moved to just teaching high school. And eventually we just taught the senior class. That moved, after we moved out here, we moved from teaching the high school class to teaching the young adults. We have a room, that, it used to be called 101, 102. Large room, it was built to hold about 50 people. We would have as many as 120 people crowded into that room every Sunday. We taught them until they got to the point they were not young adults anymore. <laughs> but he enjoyed that. He loved teaching about God. He has had, he has people in this audience right now who were members of those classes. He taught about attitude. He taught about faithfulness. He taught about being true to God, to yourself, and to your family. We have had the mutual pleasure and benefit over all these years for members of those classes to stay in touch with us, to take us to lunch, to call us, just to say thank you, just to say we remember. Those young men, young ladies are really fantastic people. I had asked the boys to think of things that they might want to say just in memory. One of Donovan's first memories, or one that he thought of, was that Ross participated on the framing crew that built the, orig the original education wing and fellowship hall of the old Brentwood Church on Arroyo Seca. They were members at University Avenue at the time, but he moved quickly to coming back to, to Brentwood. He lived in 39 places during his lifetime, 37 of which were before he was 30, and then only two over the next 64 years. He had 32 jobs in his life. 
Glenn remembered that his talents included a unique ability and a pressure to develop a simple, tight, precious relationship with each of his children. He always made himself available if they needed to talk or get advice. Glenn said he especially appreciated and remember him always being available by, by phone, even in the middle of a work day when he was away at college. Ross would set aside whatever he was doing to be ready to listen. And his words of instruction and encouragement helped Glenn throughout several major decisions in his life. He said he's thankful for the friendships that he had with Christian men and their ability to include him in the relationships. He considered them mentor mentors, men who have gone on like Ike Summerlin and Ben Baston. John Scott says, our dad was a true patriarch. He showed us how to be a man, how to be a loving husband, father, and grandfather. That would have to be include being a good daughter. He was also usually the biggest kid in the room. He was fallible, vulnerable, and decent. He was a faithful man of God, and along with their mom, raised his children to love the Lord. Each one of his children, their spouses, and all of his grandchildren would agree that Dad, Pop, Papa, and Papa Ross was their hero. I could share so many other stories with you. 70 years of friendship with a man that I called a brother, a fellow Christian, a person that I love. Not past tense. I love Ross Davis. Handsome Ross Davis. <laughs> I love his children, his wife. There are things in this world that we need to hold precious. That's relationships. Ross was open to being a friend and a mentor to anyone that would let him into their circle. He didn't wait for them to come to him. He made himself available. And he was always, always looking for ways to help other people. He was a giant among men. A true Christian. And a person that I will carry in my heart even after I die. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to you this afternoon with mixed emotions, sadness at our loss, but happiness for Ross's gain. Thank you, Father, for letting him be a part of our lives. Thank you for helping him to be who he was. I ask your blessings on his family, on each and every member of his family. Give them good memories, comfort and solace, happiness in being able to say that he was their father, husband, Grandfather, Father, we ask that you be with each of us. Forgive us when we falter. Help us to live the lives that you bless. 
in order that in everything we do, we can follow in Ross's footsteps by giving honor and glory to you and to your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. And together we say, Amen. Thank you, Rayford, for that beautiful, beautiful tribute uh, to Ross, handsome Ross. We'll not forget that. I don't know about you, but I could sit there for a few more hours, I think, and listen to more stories uh, with Rayford and Ross, and would love to hear uh, more and more stories. Um, I know each of you probably has heard uh, one of Ross's memories from his past. I uh, appreciate so much of what Rayford shared. I was actually torn as to what facet of Ross's life to really focus on as a word of encouragement from Scripture. I mean, it could be his love of his family as a window into God's heart and God's love. It could be his sweet spirit and disposition, and of course, his sense of humor. Uh, one story I want to share is not my own story, but it comes from Roger McCallan, former minister here at Brentwood Oaks. And I actually talked to Roger a couple days ago. He's watching through the stream. Uh, but he shared with me uh, years ago that uh, he was with a small group of people out in the foyer. And uh, Ross, with a very quick wit and turn of a phrase, just announced, uh, Roger, I want you to know that every sermon that you preach is better than the next. So, um, and no one was laughing harder than Roger at that. We could talk about uh, Ross as an artist, as a reflection of God, the master artist who infused this world, his creation with creativity and beauty and order. But what I would like to focus on just for a few minutes are these walls here in this room. I'd really like to focus on Ross as the architect, because our God is certainly an architect. I'd like to camp out in two places in Scripture. The first one is Acts chapter 17, where Paul is speaking to the Athenians. He's addressing them on Mars Hill. In the shadow of one of the great architectural marvels the world has ever known, uh, the Parthenon, the temple dedicated to the goddess Athena, the goddess of wisdom. But it's in Paul's speech where he really speaks to God as architect who built, framed, designed a beautiful world. And you think about the work of an architect, the imagination, the planning, the accounting for different angles and different weights and materials. Well, we see that God was indeed the master architect. Let's hear the word of God from Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 22. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, 
having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he's actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, and of this he's given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Well, it's an amazing speech that Paul gives And the verses that really jumped out to me are verses 24 through 27. How God, the Lord of heaven and earth, made, designed, planned out the world and gave boundaries to nations, giving them dwelling places on the face of the earth. In other words, the Creator made a space. The Creator makes a space for people. Right now, we are gathered in a space, and this space has Ross's handiwork, his fingerprints all over it, Uh, not to mention countless buildings, homes, and office spaces here in Austin, Texas. Uh, This is a beautiful space here. In fact, that's the the comment we often receive first from visitors. Uh, They can't believe that this place, they talk about the grounds, the beauty of the grounds, but also the beauty and the uniqueness of this auditorium with all of its natural light. And I had the same impression when I first saw it. It is a unique space, but certainly a testimony to Ross's talent and those who are working with him in making this beautiful space. Now, I'm not an architect. I'm not a builder. uh, But I can imagine there's a high level of satisfaction knowing something that you have designed and seeing something from your imagination and and the blueprints that you've drawn up come to life. And we think about this space in particular. If these walls could talk, what would they say? What memories would come about from this space? The conversations, the hugs, the tears the weddings, the funerals and the baptisms, the friendships, the budding romances, the sad goodbyes, the misspoken words and moments of forgiveness and reconciliation, the singing, the laughter, the communion with God and with one another. The thousands upon thousands of people who have worshipped in this space, not to mention the thousands and thousands of students who have come through Brentwood Christian School with so many chapels taking place right here where we are. Ross had a hand in this. Ross made a space. In some ways, there's nothing really special about these walls outside of the beauty Because the church is a people. It will always be a people. It's a temple of the spirit. A temple not made with hands. But on the other hand, we are gathered in a space. A space that took planning, care, love, perseverance, teamwork, and wisdom. Ross made a space. But it wasn't just this kind of architecture that he was involved with. Ross made a space and he made a home. He made metaphorical walls for his family that were built with love, care, uh, discipline, and faithfulness in order for his family to flourish. And that extended to his wife, his late wife Joanne, and his wife Leota. 
Ross making a space is really a reflection of the God who makes a space, who made the world. And Paul includes the reason why God made this space in Acts chapter 17. He said he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. The picture that that paints of our God is the God who makes a space for relationship. The God who is pursuing us, that we should seek him and find him in this space that he's created. And God's not far from us. God's not far from us right now. God is very, very near in his good creation in this space. This is the joy of the architect who makes a space for relationship. That's what our homes are for. It's not just to protect us from the elements, from the rainstorms, but to nurture relationship. It's not what our office spaces are for. It's not just for producing widgets. It's to foster human connection that helps us make contributions of creativity to the world. But in thinking about Ross as architect in shades of the master architect who made the world. I hear the call for us this afternoon to take seriously the call to make a space for relationship. Now, maybe we're not architects. Uh, Maybe we don't really have the skills for building spaces. But what about the spaces that are under our care? What about the skills that we bring to the table that God's graced us with? And how can we make those skills available for making a space for relationship? Could it be opening our homes to more friends, more neighbors to nurture relationships? Could it be thinking in very intentional ways of how to utilize our skills of bringing people together? How are you going to make a space for relationship as we think of Ross Davis this afternoon. Well, the final final place I want to go in the Word is the very end of the story, Revelation 21, because God, the master architect, is constantly building, reshaping, reordering this space. But there is a day when, and Paul tells us this, where God is going to bring this closure. And bring us to a new beginning. God, the master architect, is going to finish the product with a new heaven and a new earth. A new Jerusalem. And I'll read this passage in Revelation 21 as a fitting tribute to Ross Davis. A good and talented architect. But even more importantly, a faithful servant of Jesus Christ. But also I want to share this as a word of tremendous hope for us who are left behind to carry on the work. One day, God's final project will be complete through Jesus Christ. Let's read about this project in Revelation 21, verse 9. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, And on the gates, the name of the the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east, three gates. On the north, three gates. On the south, three gates. And on the west, three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. And on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring rod of gold to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city lies four square, its length the same as its width, and he measured the city with his rod, 
12,000 stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, like transparent glass. Brothers and sisters, our God was and is an architect. Ross Davis has finished his part in the project with a life devoted to God, a life of faithfulness. But Ross still has a part to play as he awaits, like the rest of us, the final day when God will bring about his new space, a new beginning, something that began at the empty tomb that will be brought to completion as the Lord returns, a space for us to dwell fully in the presence of God and of the Lamb, a house that only God could build. We're going to hear now a psalm from Donovan that speaks of this house with a reading of Psalm 127, a psalm of ascent. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, Rayford. You honor my dad. Thank all of you. You honor my dad. Hear the word of God from Psalms 127. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, Children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Pop, Papa, Papa Ross, your quiver was full. Thank you. If you'll please stand. As the, the family leaves, we'd like to bless them with this word, this word with which Moses blessed the children of Israel. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace and give you peace the lord the lord make his face to shine upon you and be great and be gracious unto you and be Oh. Uh-huh. 
the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace, and give you peace. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, and be gracious unto you, and be gracious. The Lord be gracious, gracious. Go in God's grace and let all God's people say, Amen.